Andy Hill and I'm hardware engineer in open acoustic devices. Um, and I'm also doing a PhD at the University of Southampton, where I'm looking at exploring how we can expand um, the monitoring and coverage of biodiversity with technology. And this picture you can see in the background is audio moth. And this was developed as part of my PhD with the open acoustic devices team. And today I'm also here with Ruby. Hi everyone, um, I'm Ruby and I'm also a hardware um, engineer, electronic engineer. But one of the things that I like to focus on is human centered design for electronic products. So I actually have a company that focuses on that and work um, in sort of consultancy in that area. So in this presentation, we'll be looking at how we both approach the design of acoustic hardware. And we both come from a, from a view of trying to understand how the user would use it. So the user in this case is the conservation practitioner. Um, so what is AudioMoth? Um, AudioMoth is an open source acoustic device. Um, it's very low cost, costs 50 US dollars, um, and it consists of a MEMS microphone which is like a smartphone microphone, very small, about 10 millimeters by 20 millimeters, a micro SD card, um, and most importantly, a ultra low power embedded microcontroller. Um, and with this, we can program the firmware and um, do all sorts of stuff like detection algorithms on the device. And we, we also have developed a configuration, configuration application where you can set the time, sample rates, and recording schedules using a desktop app. Um, and this makes it quite simple for a user to use the device. So AudioMoth was designed to expand the monitoring coverage of biodiversity. And because of this, it's very versatile. It can record very low frequencies and also ultrasonics. So it can be used to record bats and um, also birds and elephants that are in the lower frequencies. Um, the way we distribute the devices is with group purchasing. So like Kickstarter, um, we advertise the $50 price and we get a group of people to put in the $50. When it gets to a minimum number, we put in the order. And the um, platform we use is Group Gets. And to date, they've delivered about 10,000 AudioMoth devices around the world. Um, this is a map of where 10% of the users are using their device in deployment um, with the different species. Um, if you want to know more about this, there's a talk by my colleague Peter Prince. Um, last year, he, he did a talk about this in more detail. So I'll, I'll put that up on the chat when I have time um, after I've finished speaking. So back to the hardware. So AudioMoth is inspired by single board computers. Um, like the Raspberry Pi Ar Arduino. And these boards are very low cost. So, because they don't have an enclosure, they're very cheap to manufacture. And they also have access to GPIO pins. Both of them also have open source code. And this means you can access the GPIO pins. Um, anyone can access them for, for free, which means you can rapidly develop prototype boards and add sensors to them. They are designed for an educational user. So they've been des designed for someone with basic electronics knowledge to develop rapidly. And they use high level programming languages or an operating system. Um, so these enable very a large increase in novel conservation methods by reducing the cost and they reduce the development barriers when designing interactive electronics. So hundreds of projects have used, used these devices. Um, for all sorts of applications in conservation. The problem in conservation is that you need to go out into the field, into places where you don't have mains power and um, places where you need to enclose devices. And this is a problem with um, single board computers because um, they don't have enclosures and they're often quite power consuming. Um, so they're hard, they're hard to deploy for a long period of time. They're also, um, the DIY aspect of them makes them less accessible to less technically trained individuals, which a lot of conservation practitioners are, such as local communities and biologists. So based on single board computers, we 
um, used two methods in computer science called user-centered design and the collaborative economy to try and develop um, a single board computer that could be used for acoustic monitoring for conservation. So user-centered design is important because it aims to serve a community's needs and the tasks they want to perform. And it aims to iteratively develop a usable system achieved through the involvement of potential users during system development. Um, the second approach is a collaborative economy, economy, which focuses on the economic benefits of a shared community. And this specifically looks at the, uh, the um, advantages of fabrication using crowdfunding, um, deployments using citizen science, crowdsourcing analysis and open source design. Um, this picture shows the evol evolution of Orgimoth with a few of the deployments um, from Twitter. Um, and you can see how it's developed throughout, throughout the, um, my PhD. So what's really cool about Audiomoth is that it's an open source device. So you can go and purchase it through a group purchasing thing. So for a non-technical user, that makes that quite simple for people to get hold of them, deploy them and actually use them in the field. But for other organisations and people who, like myself, I'm a developer, but um, you know, I was commissioned by London Zoo and the Ibarda initiative to develop Micromoth. And because all of the hardware and software design files for Audiomoth are available online, they're freely available for you to use. It not only reduces the cost in the manufacture, but it also enables organisations to adapt the design for specific use cases. And this sort of open source approach makes it possible for Micromoth to benefit from the extensive user testing and development work done by open acoustic devices. So I'll give you a quick preview of Micromoth. And as you can see, it's, it's pretty micro. <laughs> it's, um, it was designed by myself in partnership with Dr. Robin Freeman um, at ZSL and Al Davis at Arabada Initiative. And the aim of the project was really simple. It was just to develop a smaller version of Audiomoth that could be used for researchers for animal born monitoring. And I mean, lots of, you know, there's lots of applications for animal born monitoring, but the first one that we wanted to focus on was avian monitoring. And so my role was basically to make it small, um, which sounds really simple when you're talking about it, but it also meant maintaining the same functionality as Audiomoth. And this meant no firmware changes, no increase in the power consumption, or loss of audio quality. So because the design is open source, it's quite easy to get hold of all the information I needed to do this. And I, I actually love making PCBs, printed circuit boards smaller. Um, but with audio, with Micromoth, I was actually restricted um, to making this smaller just because of the size of the micro SD card. Um, and so actually I had to settle with a size of 32 millimeters by 24 millimeters. My approach in design is, is always focus on how the user is going to use the item. I think simplicity is key in this and understanding how someone is actually going to, you know, use it, not just, you know, the main use case, like deploying it, but also maintaining it and setting it up and all of those different points, um, touch points of the device. And so I worked really closely with the researchers at ZSL to understand how I could reduce the size, but actually still give them the benefits of audio moth with this new application and one of the things that they brought up was um, GPS um, so animal born monitoring a lot of them use GPS and it also requires a very sort of low weight device especially for avian monitoring um, but also delivering the same power capacity because you know you need to be able to put it on an animal for a long time and still get that data um, so the Audiomoth design, I adapted it to make it possible to use it with external GPS modules and also to use lithium ion batteries. So you'll see the connectors are slightly different on Micromoth compared to Audiomoth. Um, and it was really simple things that just talking with the researchers about how they, how they actually deployed, um, you know, they'd actually been deploying Audiomoth on quite large birds for a little while, hadn't they, in a few sort of trials. Um, and they'd found um, that heat shrinking the whole device, so it's, basically putting in a sort of plastic that when you heat it, it um, shrinks down and kind of almost like a vacuum pack. Um, that was the best way that they found to attach it to the bird um, and to create like a little backpack for the bird in that way. But what they found was that this heat shrink rubbed on the microphone and caused some extra noise when they're recording. And so I worked really closely with them to arrange the connectors and change the switch so that that would be minimized as much as possible. And I'm still working with them to refine the design after each deployment. So going back to the user, getting feedback at each step. 
Yeah, so I think Steph has put the um, Peter's uh, talk from last year on, on the chat already. So that's, that's good. Um, so what's next in our development? Um, so we want to keep doing um, collaborative and iterative user-centered design in our, in our development. And for this, we've created a support forum on our website. Um, and this helps us get lots of feedback from the customers who are out deploying them. Um, and we're constantly improving and updating the device. Um, these two pictures are things we're working on at the moment. Um, on the left is a, a case, like a GoPro case, which is completely waterproof um, and uses an acoustic vent. Um, and a lot of people are, are making their own cases. So we thought, um, yeah, that is definitely something that people need. Um, and then the other thing was um, MEMS microphones have a life expectancy. So adding external microphones for the device is quite important. So our next version, AudioMoth 1.2, will have a 3.5 millimeter jack um, connector on it. So if you want to solder on your own connector, you can, and you can put any three volt bias microphone on. Um, and the picture there is a um, hydrophone. Yeah, so thanks for listening to us. Um, the rest of our team of open acoustic devices are here. Um, Alex Rogers, uh, myself, Peter Prince, Jake Snadden, who's also on, on this chat, and Patrick Doncaster. Thank you very much for having me. I'm an engineering consultant. I run the company Design Fab, um, where we basically use human centered design to create products that are actually designed for your user. So, yeah. Thanks yeah, for having thank us. You. <laughs> Oh, thanks for jumping in, guys. Um, that was super interesting. Um, there's a couple of questions coming through. Matthias, do you want to jump in first? Yeah, thank you. And thanks for the update. I was, I was lucky to meet with Alex in, in Oxford a couple of months ago, and he mentioned a Micromoth. How soon do you think it might be available? Because we have a, a couple of projects we work on with acoustic monitoring on bears, um, where we want to detect certain events like eating, uh, feeding behavior. So. We're currently developing something parallel, but no, are not really getting too much into hardware design. And this seems very suited for this. And oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, um, Ruby would know more about that. I, yeah, so we've done the initial prototype set of boards and actually um, ZSL are running the tests. We were delayed, actually. We weren't able to deploy very recently. So we've got some deployments lined up in the summer and that will be our kind of initial test data. Um, and then we'll refine the board and make it available. But I'm sure if you if you wanted to, they're probably the best people to contact Al Davis at the Arabado Initiative or Robin Freeman. I'm sure that they won't mind be passing on their details because we've got a couple of people approaching us about projects which would be suitable for a pilot so i don't know if that's sort of yeah 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 we can't we can't promise on any any dates yet it's still in development but of course we're, we're hope, yeah we're, we're hoping it will be at least ne next year maybe but yeah we can't we can't promise any, anything yet yeah, yeah. But no. I'm, i'll, I'll, I'll send an email appreciate it yeah. um okay estuardo uh, do you have a mic or do you want me to read out your question? Um, yeah, I'll re yeah, I'm reading it. Um, so, yeah, so it was, it was connected to your, um, uh, please do, okay. Um, it was co connected to what you mentioned on the forums um, uh, on the Open Acoustic Devices website, um, the fact that you're pulling together a user community, um, which is nicely connected with wild labs as well um do you, are you seeing and this is a question that came up a lot during um the registration process about building community and uh community of practice and being able to share information and knowledge and um be able to ask questions do you have one are you seeing one form around spanish users that or are you helping facilitate or you could um uh direct people to um, we're not we're, we don't have one at the moment for Spanish Spanish users, but um, probably Steph's the best person to uh, like arrange a community of users. Is that me? Yeah, because you oh, okay. uh, right. your the the Wild Labs community is probably yeah a lot, of our, a lot of our users go on onto Wild Labs and there and there's a acoustics community there, which is quite a nice platform to share. Yeah. Share 
I wonder if um, one of the things we've been looking at just to, to plug in Wild Labs is um, extending our um, language functionality. So I think, um, and I've been actually wondering if we should be running virtual meetups in uh, different languages. So if there are people who are interested in being a host um, and that we could support, we'd, we'd definitely be interested in, in, in talking to you. So drop me a message or drop me an email if, if you're interested, but we will follow up afterwards. Um, there was one final question coming from a couple of people around uh, multi-mic applications. Um, Christian wants to know that there's, uh, hmm. so uh, let's just take Teresa's questions first, um, which is around, um, does the audio morph have two mics for localization discrimination? Um, no, it, it doesn't at the moment. It just has one, one microphone, um, one analog microphone. Um, but there are, there are ways to do localization. Um, so say if you put, on audio moth, if I go back to the slide, see if I can go back. So, um, this here, um, with RXTX, you can add external modules onto there. Um, and one thing we're working on is adding a GPS module, which you can sync the time up to the closest millisecond. And with that, it means you can really localize sounds between different audio moths because you can use the time to um, actually localize quite well. So that's that's on, on our roadmap of things that we want to release in the future. Which comes to a question that um, Christian had about what is the roadmap for, for audio moth and micro moth? Um, is that the road, roadmap? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so this, hopefully it will be, um, in, in the middle of this year, hopefully we'll be releasing that. We're still, um, we're still doing a few minor adjustments to the design. Um, so they're still coming back backwards and forwards. So yeah, we're well, hopefully by the ha halfway through this year, we'll be ready. Okay, cool. Release. All right, I'm going to wrap. I know there's more questions coming through, but I'm going to suggest that Andy and Ruby, you jump into the chat and start picking up questions there. Otherwise, we can pull them into the group discussion at the end. So I'm going to say thank you to you both. Um...